Welcome to Machiavelli in the Ivory Tower. Our guest today is Rose McDermott, who is the David and Mariana Fisher University Professor of International Relations at Brown University. Rose's work focuses on political psychology as it relates to international relations, American foreign policy, and uh, nuclear strategy, which of course we'll be talking about today. She's the author of five books of innumerable academic articles, and we are so thrilled that she's here with us today. So Rose, thank you for making the time to join us. Oh, thank you for having me. Rose, it's great to meet you and let me kick it off with the first question. You and Reed Pauly published a very timely article in International Security just last year, which was entitled The Psychology of Nuclear Brinkmanship. Um, for your audience, for our audience out there that is not uh, familiar with the piece, could you just summarize the, the main arguments and findings of the piece to kick us off? Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Um, this was actually an article that was started as a result of a conversation in um, a conference that Scott Sagan held at Stanford. And um, it was a discussion about Tom Schelling and his work. And Reed is my junior colleague at Brown, fantastic scholar. And he was also at the conference. And um, we sort of looked across the table at each other at the same time saying, hey, this notion that Tom Schelling had of threats that leave something to chance actually never really unpacked the underlying psychology of what contributes to that um, uh, notion of threats that leave something to chance. And so we decided to try and unpack it in a more systematic way. And so we're looking at things like how the emotions of certain leaders contribute to their decision-making, but particularly concentrating on this notion that chance is not without choice. So just because something, you know, a threat that leaves something to chance doesn't mean that the leaders don't have choice within that chance. And um, Tom Schelling's example was always about two um, uh, hikers who were tied, you know, mountain climbing, and one of them would dance on the edge of the of the ledge, and if he fell, um, both of them would go down. And so we looked at things that involved accidents, um, things that involved, um, you know, your ability to control yourself and things that involved your ability to control other people and tried to really think through the mechanisms and the places where chance actually involves leaders having choices about reacting or not reacting or making an action or not making an action um, with particular application to nu nuclear deterrence and what happens if you're in the situation where you are tied together. Like I make a choice and then my use of nuclear weapons also destroys you, right? So. Uh, what does that involve? And so this piece was, um, you know, designed to really unpack that. And it, it's part of a larger research agenda that Reed and I and <clears throat> one of my um, former graduate students, Dan Post, who's at the Naval War College, and um, Paul Slovic, who's an eminent psychologist at the University of Oregon, are involved in, in doing with regard to uh, issues of nuclear decision making. That's great, Rose. And what you're really doing, and you already pointed it out, is sort of zoning in on the centrality of individual decision makers for understanding brinkmanship and nuclear decision making more broadly. And as you also point out in the article, a lot of work on nuclear decision making fails to take the role of decision makers into account. Now, why do you think that is? And do you see that changing at all? Is the field finally moving into a direction where those individual factors, the role of emotion, the role of psychology is being taken more seriously? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, a really central aspect of moving the field forward. So I think traditionally the field has been dominated by uh, those who are realists, who believe in realists that come out of that tradition, um, in some ways going all the way back to Machiavelli, uh, to the title of your po podcast, but you know, more recently, certainly the many generations who were trained in kind of Hans Morgenthau's version of you know, classical realism that really assumed that um, states were the central actors, that it wasn't really individuals, and that the external environment and the world situation was so constraining that uh, individual uh, idiosyncrasies, personality, things like that, didn't have the space to move against those constraints. Um, and I think for a long time, a lot of people believe that. And I think a lot of people still believe it. Um, but it never made sense to me, you know, because the logical extension of that is like, oh, okay, 
Um, if you're in Germany in 1930, would anybody else besides Hitler have behaved exactly the way he did? You know, if it had been Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, would they have behaved as as um, Hitler did? And it just didn't make sense to me. Um, and so um, I think that this new, I mean, they're calling it new, you know, behavioral revolution in international relations. It really goes back to Bob Jarvis, right? So this is not new. It started in the 70s. He did the defining work. He is you know, still um, in many ways, the the seminal and foundational work in that regard. And so I think the movement to say, hey, there is more space for individual leaders to actually make a difference than you think. Um, and I think in the wake of people like um, uh, Donald Trump, who upended the system in lots of ways, uh, Putin, uh, who is clearly upending the system in lots of ways, it's a lot easier for people to accept the notion that individuals can have a huge impact even on a very constraining external environment. And so um, I think it's it's a much easier case to make than it was when I started doing it in the 90s. <laughs> um, and so part of, part of the goal in all of my work has been to say, okay, leaders make a difference. How do they make a difference? In what ways do they make a difference? What are the scope conditions? In what conditions are they likely to be able to exert an influence? And in American foreign policy, I think that that's in the realm of foreign policy, right? Especially around nuclear decision making, where one man can actually make the decision to launch nuclear weapons, which I don't think is a good idea. And, you know, people like Bill Perry have been leading this charge to have it be not just one person, but, you know, require the incorporation of other decision makers, which I think is a very important um, um, change um, to move away from one man for that reason. Rose, um I fully subscribe to the arguments that you're putting forward in my own work. So let me just caveat my next question by saying that. But, you know, even though we're talking about the importance of individuals here, and that's obviously a focus of, of your body of work and of this article, um, I imagine it's probably also true that, you know, certain kinds of people are more likely to seek executive office and to be elected than other people. Um, you talk about this a little bit in, in your piece with, with Reed, but I wonder if there's anything that we can kind of generalize about, you know, the psychologies of the folks, as you call it, in the war room, um, who are really the ones responsible for making decisions uh, in the nuclear space in the face of uncertainty. And, you know, if you do think that there are things that we can generalize about these folks, does that decrease the leverage that leaders might have over their adversaries in something like a brinkmanship scenario, like the ones you talk about, because it might make their choices a little bit more predictable, or is that not really coming into play here at all? Yeah, I love that question, Sarah. Um, you know, I think that in in unrelated work I've done over the years, um, especially a book I did on um, intelligence with Uri Bar Joseph, but um, a series of war games I did almost 20 years ago, you know, we did a bunch of personality variables on the students who ran through the war games, a couple hundred people at Harvard. Um, and at that time, it was really kind of theoretically driven by this stuff in social psychology about, you know, the variables that would matter. Is it social dominance? You know, is it extroversion? Um, I'm not a big believer in um, uh, this, uh, you know, big five thing that a lot of um, psychologists really like at the moment. But anyway, we did a bunch of those. And the only one that ended up being statistically significant at the time, and it was highly statistically significant, was narcissism. And that was interesting to me, but I didn't really take it all that seriously. And then when I was doing the intelligence book with Uri, they were case studies of intelligence um, successes and intelligence failures that were that were matched, you know, like um, Pearl Harbor versus Midway, right? Like these, these matched intelligence cases. And it just became very, very clear that the central feature in each of the big failures had to do with the narcissism of the main leader, not necessarily the president, but, you know, like MacArthur was a, you know, a really good example of this. And I became increasingly convinced of, of the really negative role of narcissism on decision making. And um, my collaborator on a lot of the work that I've done in other areas um, in behavior genetics, Pete Hatami, who does a lot of work on narcissism independently of me and had also been doing work on narcissism with regard to public opinion that showed kind of the same phenomenon. And so I think that to the extent that there's a personality factor that's particularly destructive, it's narcissism. And I think the reason for that is it takes the focus of the leader away from their constituency and focuses it entirely on them, right? Um, and the other real problem with narcissism is that 
narcissists can be incredibly charming and really compelling and charismatic initially. But the minute that you kind of um, threaten their ego, they become extremely aggressive very, very early in that threat. Like before somebody else would even experience a threat, they're reacting aggressively. Um, and so that can be particularly destructive. The reason that I think um, it's especially destructive in situations of strategic interaction between leaders, um, to the second part of your question, Sarah, is that um, I think it's really easy to manipulate narcissists. It's really easy for one leader to manipulate another leader by playing to their ego, by saying, oh, you're so brilliant. You're so great. You're so awesome. If you just do what I want, you'll be even more great, more awesome. Everybody will love you. You know, they're very easy to pull their strings. Whereas somebody who's less narcissistic would have the thought of like, what is this person trying to get at? What are they trying to get out of me? You know, what are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? That thought never occurs to a narcissist. It's like, well, of course I deserve it. I'm really wonderful, you know? Um, and so these days, when I think about the most destructive personality characteristic across the board, I mean, you can see it in Putin, like there's lots of leaders who are like this. Um, that's the one that worries me the most um, and, and has huge individual variants. Um, and I'll just also note that when you look at it statistically globally, it's narcissism is a much more male phenomenon than female phenomenon. And so it's also much more likely to show up in leaders who tend on average globally to be male. Well, that was... Fascinating. I had, I must admit, never thought about narcissism in quite that way and what it might mean for, for nuclear decision making. But I want to move from the narcissists to those who try to appear as, as madmen, if I may. Uh, Rose, in your article, you talk about Nixon's madman theory and this effort to create the impression of irrationality as a way of getting the other side to back down without picking a fight. Now, first of all, just for our listeners who are not so familiar with Nixon and his actions, perhaps you could talk a little bit about this madman approach. But then I'm also curious uh, as to what you think about Putin's nuclear saber rattling today and whether you see that indeed as an example of the madman approach and whether perhaps Putin is falling in the same trap uh, as Nixon did at his time, namely failing to understand that he cannot in fact control the perceptions that others have of him and his actions. The um, Nixon's madman thing comes out of a story that's told in um, a couple of different memoirs of his advisors about um, his frustration during the war of Vietnam that the Vietnamese, that the North Vietnamese weren't, um, you know, essentially surrendering to American superior, you know, military power. And so there's this story about him walking on the beach in Santa Monica with his advisor Haldeman and basically saying, <clears throat> um, this is how I'm going to solve the problem. It's, you know, it's the madman theory. I'm going to um, leak the story that Nixon's just crazy, right? He's a madman and you never know when he's going to push the button and you never know what he's going to do. And that's going to scare the North the Vietnamese so much that they'll be at the peace table in a week. Um, and he did leak that story. And there may have been people who thought he was crazy, but they were more likely in his own administration rather than in the North Vietnamese. And it didn't work for the North Vietnamese. They did not, <clears throat> they did not in any way, shape, or form uh, decide to accede or surrender or concede to what he wanted to do. The war didn't last, you know, the war lasted several years after that, and it, you know, ended through a series of negotiations and American humiliation with the withdrawal in Saigon, uh, the withdrawal from Saigon. And so it was not a successful strategy. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a hard analogy to make with Putin. And <clears throat> it may not be wrong, but I worry about these kinds of analogies. And, you know, the most dominant one in American foreign policy, of course, is anybody you don't like is like Hitler, right? That's the one everybody says, because the notion then is that the implication you're supposed to draw is if somebody's like Hitler, then you have to stop them now. Because, you know, when the British didn't stop him in 38, then that led to the Second World War. And so the implication is if somebody's like Hitler, you can't stop them. So better to stop them sooner rather than later. Um so whether or not Putin's like Nixon, there may be similarities, but you know, I think it's too hard to know whether or not um, Putin is <clears throat> consciously saying, I'm gonna make people think I'm crazy and I'm gonna uh, threaten nuclear weapons and that'll make Ukraine surrender, that'll make the West um, stop supporting Ukraine, or if he really believes it. Um, and I think we don't have enough information about Putin to know. 
Um, you know, I see indications where he clearly believes he's in the, um, you know, historical legacy of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. And if he has that level of narcissism, he may not be kidding. I mean, he may really believe that in his worldview of the way that he needs to reconstitute Russia in his new image, that Ukraine constitutes some kind of existential threat in a way that he actually would use nuclear weapons. I hope that's not true. But um, Paul Slovak and, and Reid and I actually did a piece for Foreign Affairs last summer where we basically said, hey, you know, the risk may be higher than you think. Um, and so <clears throat> it may be a self-conscious manipulation the way that Nixon did, but it may actually believe, you know, be what he believes. And I think we don't have enough information into his personal psychology to be able to differentiate which is which from this kind of distance. I mean, there may be people who can do that, but I'm not one of them. Rose, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to move from the specifics of your article to sort of talking about your approach and your methodology uh, a little bit more broadly. So as you've mentioned a couple of times already in our conversation, and as you clearly show in this piece, you know, bringing these concepts <laughs> from psychology and behavioral economics into security studies can really help us in a lot of ways because it helps us challenge some of the you know, more normative assumptions that we have about how individuals behave and get us focused more on how they actually do things uh, in the face of uncertainty. Now, of course, your focus in this particular piece with Reed is on you know, brinkmanship and crisis decision-making. I've seen other great scholars uh, bring the same literature in to challenge the underpinnings of rational deterrence theory. I'd love to hear from you, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and have access to any data set. Um, are there some areas of, you know, nuclear decision making where you really think applying findings from psychology and behavioral economics could further enhance scholarship and then also practice? Yeah, the work that um, uh, Paul Slovak and I and Reed and Dan are trying to do is to actually um, uh you know, do a series of experiments that look at how people make decisions about when to use the public um, to support the use of nuclear weapons. Um, but one of the things that that seems important to me is to think through how to institute protocols at the level of the central decision makers. So within the Department of Defense, within the executive branch of the White House, where if you're confronted with um, a crisis that may potentially involve the use of nuclear weapons, that you actually have a protocol, the way that you have a decision protocol. And the way that I think about it is the way that hospitals instituted protocols a while ago, where a lot of them were things that we'd look at and we'd think, that's stupid. Everybody knows that. And they're things like wash your hands before you, you know, do surgery. Um, put a sticker on which leg you're going to amputate, you know, things where it's just like, are you kidding me? And when they did that, um, and you know, it was a big process and they instituted it, they saved 100,000 lives in like a year, um, maybe more than a year, but it was in a very, you know, it was a remarkable thing where you're like, wow, having this really standard set of procedures that you know everybody has to go through, that you know you have to do, and that you know everybody around you has to do, which means it's fine for you to sanction somebody who you don't see washing their hands. Um, if you could come up with a similar kind of protocol decision-making for a crisis, to me, I think that that would be helpful because I worry that senior leaders who are very smart and know a lot of things about a lot of things don't necessarily know a lot about decision making. And so things that might be obvious to people who study decision making may not actually be obvious to decision makers themselves. <clears throat> and so if you could institute a kind of protocol that they would have to walk through and know that everybody else had to walk through, one of the things it gives you is a sense of control, a sense of um, security, a sense of certainty. Um, but in a time of stress, that can be really helpful, particularly if you've practiced it in a not time of stress. So like you practice it when nothing's going on, then when you have to actually do it and you're familiar with it, it gives you a sense of mastery. It gives you a sense of like, I know what I'm doing. I know what I need to do. Um, and I think that that really in lots of ways could reduce the risk of inadvertent escalation. And so if there was one thing that I would love to see happen, that would be it. Whether or not that can happen, whether or not leaders would be amenable to implementing that kind of protocol, I don't know. But when I think about the intersection of like 
you know, behavioral um, aspects of psychology or economics and international relations, that's where I see the most um, applied productive uh, integration. Hmm. That's so interesting. And it actually leads perfectly to my next question, because you were just sort of talking about the differences between you know, for example, people who study decision making and then the people who are actually responsible for making those decisions. Um, obviously, you know, all elected officials are just people. So it makes sense that the choices that they're making and the behaviors that they exhibit, um, you know, are governed by those same like biases and heuristics and risk perceptions and emotions and things like that as as everyone else. But um, we've already invoked Robert Jervis. I was thinking about something that, you know, he pointed out, which is that Elites do have different, so to speak, priors than most of the general population. They have different past experiences. And those could potentially influence, for example, you know, the ways that they estimate the probability of certain outcomes occurring. So I'm wondering, you know, given all of the great things that behavioral economics and political psychology can tell us about how leaders behave, are there any, you know, limits to that? Are there limits to what findings that are essentially based on a general public can tell us about how decision making happens, given that that's so much the purview of elites. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that the answer in some ways is we don't know, and it depends on domain, right? So there's certain places where um, I think that um, you could say, yeah, elites are pretty much the same as other people. For example, you can show that elites actually fall prey to the same kinds of confirmation bias and other kind of heuristic biases that, um, you know, Tversky and Kahneman identified. Um, but there are other places where um, we know from other kinds of studies that elites can be different. Um, there's some, you know, really interesting um uh, cognitive neuroscience MRI data, for example, showing that um, what happens with people who have expertise is not necessarily that they invoke different parts of their brain, but they just can access them faster, right? That you sort of have this established thing that's more accessible. In some ways, that's good because you can, you know, uh, access a lot of knowledge quickly. Uh, in some ways, it's bad because it means that you're relying on pre-existing scripts and schemas, and it, it may make it harder for you to think outside the box, you know, to to have um, a more creative response because you have these patterns that you sort of rely on. Um, I think that, you know, there are leaders who have, for example, you know, a lot more specific knowledge about, perf you know, um, certain topics. But I don't think that that makes them, you know, less susceptible to some of the problems that plague other people. And so I think if you want to know whether experts or elites are similar or different to regular people uh, in a given domain, you'd actually have to do those comparative studies. And the problem is it's really hard because elites won't participate, right? Elites don't want to um, be in experiments where they can be identified, particularly if they think that they might be identified in a way that makes them look less than, um, you know, some regular part of the population. But without those kinds of comparisons, you really don't know the scope conditions under which um, elites or, um, you know, um, uh, decision makers differ from the regular public. So <clears throat> we can speculate, um, but I think in the absence of real evidence, it's very hard to know um, the ways in which the difference between those two populations might manifest in a crisis. Um, my, my default tends to be that leaders, they're not as special as they think they are, <laughs> right? They're, they're, they're people. And it doesn't mean that they don't have... Um, special expertise, but they often also have special personality characteristics like we talked about that make them more vulnerable to certain things than regular than other people might be. And here I think about, especially in democracies, it takes a particular kind of person to put themselves out there and run for election. You got to raise a lot of money. You got to be out in public all the time. You got to like meet people. You got to you know, engage in all these behaviors. And basically, you know, the media is doing a colonoscopy on you six times a day. And you have to have the kind of, you know, thick skin to be able to withstand that pressure on yourself and your family, and also believe enough in yourself and what you have to offer to sustain that. That's not a normal person. That's an outlier, right? And so, there's a lot of self-selection of the kinds of people that go into politics, even in a democracy. You know, I'm sure it's worse in authoritarian um, systems where you kill off opposition and stuff. But 
um, even in democracies, it's it's an unusual person that self-selects into that. And so what may make elites different is not that they know more or that they have some specialized, you know, access or some specialized, you know, um, uh, cognitive abilities, but the pre-existing personality characteristics that allow them to put themselves in the situation where they would be in a position of power. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they like power and they want power. And that may also distort the way that individuals think about how to exercise power. I, I'm curious, Rose, because with this with this video cast, we're always trying to bridge uh, the gap between theory and practice. Um, I'm very curious about the implications of your research and how policymaking folks have reacted to it. Uh, you already talked a little bit about some of the recommendations that one might take from your work, such as instituting a decision protocol in the White House or in DOD in order to take some of that haste and that rush out of decision making uh, in times of stress. I believe that at the end of your article, you note a couple of other recommendations that might, might, one might take from, from your analysis. And so I'm curious whether you could talk a little bit about those, first of all, sort of implications and recommendations, and then also whether you've engaged policymaking circles on, on those and what the reaction has been. Yeah, I think this is really challenging because I think that there's, you know, this, as we all know, and we regret and never seems to change this real divide between policymakers and academics. Part of it is that academics don't tend to penetrate the higher levels of decision making. You know, you get um, exceptions, you know, people like Condi Rice or whatever, but it, they're exceptions, right? They're not, they're not the rule. Um, and I think that a lot of policymakers think that academics are kind of bloviators, right? They go on too long, they talk in jargon, they don't really know what real people are like, you know, all that kind of stuff. And academics think that policymakers are stupid, right? And they think that they're really just um, lazy and craven and really only care about money and getting elected. And so there's not a lot of overlap in generosity toward each other's life goals. And it makes it very difficult to have communication across that, right? Um, how do you get an academic to think that somebody who's slick and shallow and pays $400 for their haircut is a serious thinker about you know, nuclear decision making? And how do you get a policymaker to spend an hour listening to somebody who's speaking in their version of you know, academic Greek? Um, it's just very, very difficult. And I think part of it is that both sides don't understand the pressures that are exerted on the other side. Academics really don't understand the time pressures um, in the way that, I mean, academics have huge time pressures, don't get me wrong, but it's not the like, okay, you have to take a vote on this thousand page bill that you haven't had a chance to read in an hour, right? Like, and also just the sheer volume of information and knowledge that has to be um, uh, assimilated very quickly. Um, and the kind of um, social rules of politics, I think, are hard because academics, to be a really successful academic, part of you has to be able to be kind of introverted, um, to be able to sit and write alone and not do it in these huge groups of people. And so I think policymakers certainly don't understand the pressures that academics are under and the incentive structures that work around publish or perish, but also you know, the challenges that are involved in teaching huge groups of students who don't want to be there and, you know, all those kinds of challenges. And so um, it doesn't make it easy on either side, right? Um, and so, you know, I would love to figure a way to have academics be able to come up with, you know, like I said, with the protocol, you know, a very short, accessible series of recommendations that seem tractable um, and um, helpful to academic, to policymakers. Whether or not they would actually integrate that, that's a harder call. You know, it depends on their own incentives and what they're going to do. Um, I believe that they don't want the world to blow up, right? Like the one thing that everybody has in common, I hope, um, is that they don't want the world to blow up. I mean, there there may be exceptions to that. There, you know, there's obviously suicide bombers. There may be, you know, I don't I don't know about Putin's thinking, you know, but but in general, people don't want the world to blow up. And so, if you can align around a shared mission or a shared goal, then I think that that's you know that's the way to at least try to begin the conversation. Um, 
you know, I, I think it's hard to be hopeful around this, but there are people who've done it successfully. You know, Bob Jervis is a great example of somebody who ran the CIA, you know, historical review committee, had a lot of former students in government, you know, would sort of go back and forth between those communities. But there aren't a lot of people I see that are able to really do that successfully. Um, and I know that's not a great responsive answer to your question, Hannah, but I think it's because it's a hard problem. Oh, Rose, it's okay to not have a complete answer to the tough <laughs> questions because I think this is something obviously that, you know, both communities have struggled with for a long time. It's something that they'll continue to struggle with. We hope we make a small contribution with this video cast, but certainly being able to talk to experts like yourself and kind of tease out some of the policy implications of your work is super, super important to that. So thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to do that. Thank you for taking some time out of your schedule to be with us. And uh, for our listeners and viewers, uh, stay tuned for coming episodes. Thank you so much.